Hello and welcome to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. You're listening to my show on Boston Free Radio and watching it on Scat V. It's great to have you with me. Um, so this is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I've got five new movies to review. Actually, five brand, excuse me, four brand new. One that's been around for a little while, but I needed a fifth movie, so I'm going to review it. That that one came out in 2014, so I'm going to get to that one near the very end of the show. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Jungle Book. This is the latest live-action remake from Disney um, amidst a line of live-action live adaptations of classic Disney films. And this is still continuing a growing trend, which I actually thought would be a dud at first. Because when I believe that whenever a movie... It, that movies that should be remade should be bad movies, not good movies, especially classic Disney films. But the trend has since proven me wrong. Granted, movies like Alice in Wonderland and Maleficent haven't been perfect Disney adaptations, live-action adaptations of classic animated movies. But last year's Cinderella, directed by Kenneth Branagh, and this year's The Jungle Book, directed by Jon Favreau, have actually proven me wrong. And what I like about The Jungle Book is what I liked last year about Cinderella, in the sense that it pays tribute to the original classic animated movie from 1967, but it doesn't copy it. Not in plot, not in very many of the lines even. I think it takes its own artistic liberties, and most of the artistic liberties are actually refreshing. And if they're not refreshing, they're at least a little bit surprising. So, most people know the story about the Jungle Book. It's about a man-cub, or a human, known by a man-cub, known as a man-cub, to the animals in the jungle, whose name is Mowgli, who flees the jungle after a threat from the tiger Shere Khan. Guided by a black panther named Bagheri, Bagheera, and a bear named Baloo, Mowgli embarks on a journey of self-discovery, though he also meets creatures who don't have his best interests at heart. So, The Jungle Book is live action, but features CGI animated characters. But I do have to say, I was skeptical about the use of CGI animated characters, because they sometimes look like, in fact, a lot of the times, especially when combining live action and animation, the CGI characters actually look like cartoon characters. In this movie, the CGI characters actually look like real animals. And I would have thought they were real animals if they hadn't actually spoken. But I was just amazed by the seamlessness of the animation. And the voice cast by just about everyone involved, was actually really good. Um, Baloo, the bear, is voiced by Bill Murray in, in this movie, who was pretty close to the original animated character from the 60s. And I thought the voice of Bagheera, Ben Kingsley, was perfectly cast. There's also Shere Khan, voiced by Idris Elba, who, this isn't the first time he's voiced an animated character, but it's the first time he's voiced a villain, and he makes a really good villain. I also thought that what was probably the least traditional choice of casting was the voice of Ka, the snake, the hypnotizing snake, who's voiced by Scarlett Johansson this time. The reason I call it an interesting casting choice, although probably not the one I would have chosen, was Ka was not actually a female character, at least not in the original animated Jungle Book, but... I did like the fact that they turned Ka into a female character. I just wish there could have been more of her. But probably the oddest casting choice in this movie was that of King Louis, the uh, chimpanzee, who in the movie was voiced by Louis Prima, or rather in the animated movie is voiced by Louis Prima. In this movie, he's voiced by Christopher Walken. And I wasn't quite sure if Christopher Walken was the right choice. Then again, Christopher Walken made the character of King Louis different, but entertaining. What I was really taken aback by was the fact that they made King Louis in this movie the size of King Kong. Whereas in the original Jungle Book, both the book and the movie, he's a chimpanzee and he's the king of the apes, but he's about the same size. 
maybe a little bit bigger than his other apes. But uh, still, I, I thought it was, uh, if, if it wasn't um, a, a design with which I agreed, at least it made it interesting to watch. And the kid who played Mowgli, I thought, was actually pretty good. He's an actor named, and I hope I'm pronouncing this name right, Neil Sethi. I probably would have preferred somebody a little bit older to have played Mowgli, like somebody who was maybe 10 or 12, whereas this kid seemed to be 8 years old. But I thought he did a good job with, with what, he, what he had. And as I said, the story of The Jungle Book in this movie, which the screenplay written by Justin Marks, pays a lot of tribute to the original animated Jungle Book, but what I liked about it was the fact that it didn't copy the original Jungle Book. As for the book by Rudyard Kipling, I have to confess that while I'm a big proponent of reading the book before seeing the movie, I actually haven't seen, or rather, I haven't read the original Jungle Book. So, yeah, I'm one of those audience members who only goes by what he sees in the movies. So I couldn't even tell you if in the original book written by Rudyard Kibling, the animals actually talk. They might not actually talk. I also haven't seen the 1994 remake of The Jungle Book, which I didn't realize until recently was also a Disney production. But I don't, I don't hear very much about that 1994 Jungle Book. So I think if there are fans of that Jungle Book movie from the 90s. I don't think this this movie that just came out really compares to that one. In other words, I think probably people who see this movie, who've also seen the 1994 one, will find the 2016 one a lot better. And before I run out of time, I'm just going to say I give the Jungle Book my rating of knockout. I thought it was, in the animation part, superbly animated. I like the fact that it took its own artistic liberties, and I thought that John Favreau did a great job directing, and I think he definitely shows a lot of promise the same way he did when he directed the first two Iron Man movies. So he directed the first two Iron Man movies, then he took somewhat of a break with a lower-budget movie, Chef, which I also really liked. I thought that was one of the most underrated movies of 2014, and fortunately shows that he still hasn't lost his touch with directing big budget movies. So good for him. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Barbershop, The Next Cut. This is the third in the Barbershop movies, and it's actually the first Barbershop movie to be made in 12 years. What took the movie so long to make a sequel? Who knows? But either way, once you catch up with a lot of the characters in the movie, including Calvin, who returns here, played by Ice Cube, Eddie, the old-timer in the barbershop, played by Cedric the Entertainer, and several other recurring characters from the original movie. It's almost like time hasn't... Well, I should say a lot has changed, but there are some things that haven't. That's the best way to put it. Yay! All right. So, Barbershop the Next Cut brings us back to the barbershop on the south side of Chicago, and as the barbers who work there, as their surrounding community has taken a turn for the worst in terms of gun violence and things that are actually plaguing the south side of Chicago today, the crew at Calvin's Barbershop come together to bring some much-needed change to their neighborhood. So that's the main plot of Barbershop The Next Cut, and very much like the first two Barbershop movies, there are several subplots which the main characters are trying to juggle in the barbershop and also their own personal lives. And I think one of the things I really liked about the original barbershop was the fact that all the subplots of the various characters were weaved together very well. In Barbershop The Next Cut, fortunately, I, I will say I did enjoy this movie. There were a lot of funny parts, a lot of parts where I laughed out loud. And certainly, Barbershop The Next Cut has a lot more going for it than other comedies that have been released so far this year with predominantly African-American characters like Meet the Blacks and probably most especially like Fifty Shades of Black in that it doesn't, for the most part, adhere or even succumb to a lot of stereotypes. All the characters, except probably Nicki Minaj's character, are pure archetypes. And I do have to 
reluctantly say that Nicki Minaj's character is probably the one stereotype in this movie, but more on that later. Unfortunately, the one bad thing about Barbershop The Next Cut is there are a lot of subplots in this movie that don't really mesh together very well. And in fact, I think if they took two particular subplots out, the movie would have been would have benefited greatly. I don't want to say the movie would have been a lot better. It would have been, but I enjoyed a lot of the good parts of this movie immensely. I think there were two parts that needed to be taken out. One was the subplot about Calvin, again, Ice Cube's character, seriously considering moving his barbershop to the north side of Chicago as a direct result of all the gang violence and shootings that are going on the south side of Chicago. Granted, he has a good point, but that, that subplot, I think, almost gets in the way of the main plot of the barbershop holding a ceasefire that they want trending on Twitter so that they'll bring awareness to the violence in Chicago. I thought, yeah, that got in the way. It didn't really fit very well. The other subplot was involving the characters of Terry, who's played by Eve, and also her husband in this movie, Rashad, who's played by Common. The subplot involving both of them also involves Nicki Minaj's character, who also works in the barbershop. And the problem I have with Nicki Minaj's character is, yeah, sometimes her acting, because I think Nicki Minaj is not a terrible actress, but she still has a ways to go if she wants to pursue acting. In other words, she has to play other characters besides herself. And I think in this movie, she almost plays herself in terms of her screen persona, or rather her stage persona. Basically, in this movie, she wears the same outfits that you would probably see her wearing in the music video Anaconda, as well as some other music videos of hers. And the plot involving Common, Eve, and Nicki Minaj is that there are rumors going around that Common's character is having an affair with Nicki Minaj's character. And naturally, that doesn't sit well with Terry, to say the least. But there are various contrived instances in this movie that just don't really work very well with the three characters, especially... Common and Nicki Minaj. Fortunately, Common and Eve are both really good actors, but that subplot involving the alleged affair between the two barbers, it didn't really work very well with me. I actually thought more time should have been focused on the other two female barbers in the barbershop movie, namely Angie, played by Regina Hall, and probably most especially Bree, who's played by relative newcomer Margot Bingham. And I, they seemed like really interesting characters, but too much focus was placed on Nicki Minaj's character, which I think probably was less of the fault of the director, I'm speculating, as much as it was the studio heads. People probably said that the Barbershop movies alone, the first two, even though they were big hits, were not enough of a draw, so we're going to have to get somebody who appeals to a younger demographic as if Ice Cube wasn't enough there with the success of Straight Outta Compton last year and the success of the movie he did with Kevin Hart, Ride Along, two years ago, not to mention its sequel this year. But I, I guess that's more the fault of the studio, although I'm speculating. But having said that, I do focus quite a bit on the weaknesses of the movie. I thought the strength of the movie was actually the writing and the dialogue that's delivered by just about every cast member in here, most notably Ice Cube and Cedric the Entertainer, and also some of the other main barbers in the movie, like Jimmy, played by Sean Patrick Thomas. And there's also a token Indian barber in this movie, whose name is Raja, and he's played by a guy who's not exactly a newcomer, but I've seen his face before. I just, you wouldn't know his name. It's Atkarsh Ambudkar. But anyway, I'm running out of time. I'll give, I'll give Barbershop, I was torn between giving it a checkout and a knockout, but I really did enjoy it immensely, and its strengths far outweighed its weaknesses, so I'm giving it my rating of a marginal knockout, because it's a movie that makes you laugh, it does make you think, 
And if it just toned down its subplots a little bit, it probably would have been better than the first one. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Midnight Special. Midnight Special is the latest directed by and written by Jeff Nichols. And if that name doesn't sound familiar to you, he also directed movies like Mud and Take Shelter. And Mud was actually a movie that was kind of on the underground, or rather not very much in the public consciousness, until it came out around the same time as Matthew McConaughey's other Academy Award winning movie, Dallas Buyers Club. And Mud was actually probably one of my favorite movies of 2012, and one that's still somewhat underseen. But Midnight Special is the official follow-up to Mud, and I'll say right off the bat, it's good, but it's not nearly as good as Mud. Granted, it doesn't have the same plot, but unfortunately, there could have been a lot more done with Midnight Special than I think was actually done. So Midnight Special is about a father and son who go on the run and are pursued by the government and a cult drawn to the child's special powers. The problem here is not the plot. The problem is I thought that the movie started in the middle of a compelling story when it really should have started at the beginning. So this son, or rather this child, who has special powers, trying to find out the name of the actor, uh, the, the kid's name in the movie is Alton Meyer, and he's played by a relative newcomer named Jaden Lieberher. And Alton in this movie is a kid with, I guess, connections to the third kind, although it's not really elaborated upon how he got these powers. And maybe how he got them doesn't really matter, but... I've just seen a few too many movies with the psychic kid. It almost seems like a science fiction or even horror movie cliche. And I don't think this movie added really very much to it. So when you first meet this kid, Alton, he's driving with his father, uh, Roy, played by Michael Shannon, and an acquaintance of Roy's, Lucas, played by Joel Edgerton. So you find out through various shots of TV news that this kid, Alton, has been allegedly kidnapped by his father. But you, turn, but you later find out that Roy and his son, Alton, are on a mission. And what that mission is, I won't reveal on this show, but, but you, you, you get into it as you're going along. But you find out that the father took the son away from a Mormon cult, presumably in Utah. And what I found interesting was that this cult used this boy to, in their words, connect with God. And you find that out from the police interrogations with the cult uh, from the U.S. government, who's also tracking down Alton for reasons I don't want to get into right now. But I thought, actually, it would have been fascinating to have seen this boy interacting with the cult and also actually seeing his father take his son away from the cult. I thought that would have made a very intriguing story. Instead, you don't really know what the cult believes in. You assume that they're a Mormon offshoot because of the clothes they wear, but you don't really know exactly what they believe and what makes them differ from mainstream Latter-day Saints Mormons. And granted, you don't need a whole text explanation for this. You just need to know something about what they believe based on maybe what they say. And even though there is a brief church service within the cult in this movie, you don't even really know if they're a cult. I, I didn't know. I, in fact, I, I think it's a lot of cults like these that really give Mormons... A bad name. I do think if you actually saw the kid interacting with these members of a cult, that would have told me a lot about the people in the cult and also the kid. And it would have probably told me a lot more about why Roy, Michael Shannon's character, took him away from the cult and why he needed the assistance of his friend or acquaintance, Lucas. It turns out Lucas, who again is played by Joel Edgerton, is a former 
police officer. And that part actually gets pretty important once you get into the movie. And there's also the sub, well, the part where Roy reunites Alton with his mother, named Sarah Tomlin, who in this movie is played by Kirsten Dunst. And you find out Kirsten Dunst also escaped from this cult. So you, there's a lot of emphasis in this movie on the action. That is, the road trip that these three men embark upon, the reuniting mother with son. But I actually found the part where the, the son, Alton, meets these beings from a third kind, probably the least interesting part of the movie. And I think that the, the movie emphasized upon that part the most. When I think we're living in a day and age where we have seen so many movies about psychics, so many movies about people, particularly children, having clairvoyant encounters with um, beings outside of the planet Earth, that the, the most anticipated part, or rather the formerly most anticipated part, of actually seeing the aliens has, oddly enough, probably ever since contact, been the, not only the least important part, but also the least intriguing part. In fact, I thought that was the least intriguing part about J.J. Abrams' movie Super 8, which otherwise I really liked. So I'm running out of time here, as usual. I'm going to give Midnight Special my rating of a checkout. I thought the acting in the movie was good, particularly by Michael Shannon, Kirsten Dunst, and actually Adam Driver, who's also in this movie as a government agent. I, I thought the scenes with him were really good. I thought the kid in the movie was decent, but we've seen Psychic Children before in movies like The Shining and Stir of Echoes, and this movie doesn't bring anything new to the genre, at least not to me. So, it's not a bad movie by any means, but one that's just a little bit forgettable. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a documentary called The Dying of the Light. The Dying of the Light is actually a pretty small documentary, directed and written by relative newcomer Peter Flynn, who was only 29 when he directed the movie. And it's actually not his first movie. Another documentary he did was one called Blazing the Trail, The O'Kalums in Ireland, which I haven't seen, but based on Dying of the Light, I might check it out. Also, the documentary The Dying of the Light is not to be confused with the 2014 movie Dying of the Light, starring Nicolas Cage. The Dying of the Light is a, a documentary that explores the history and craft of motion picture presentation through the lives and stories of the last generation of career projectionists. So, The Dying of the Light is the movie that actually takes you into the projection booth when, I will admit, I try to not take any part of the movie-going experience for granted, but I do have to confess that the projectionists and the way the film is projected is usually one of the last things I think about when I go into a movie. But the great part about The Dying of the Light is because of seeing this movie, I've gained a greater appreciation for projectionists. So you get a sense of what the life of a projectionist is like, or at least was like, when they were using actual films. Now a lot of projection is digital. In fact, there was a staggering statistic that in 2008, 14% of theaters in this country used digital projection, i.e., projection without using actual film. It was using computers. And in 2014, 93% of theaters used digital projection. That's astonishing. And I do have to say that part of it is a little sad that we're moving from one technology to another. In fact, I think any shift from one technology to another certainly has nostalgia going along with it. And also, I, I think it's an understatement to say hurt feelings, but certainly the people who worked in the industry when they did it the old way, it's interesting to hear their stories. And it's also bittersweet to hear when times changed for them. And you certainly get a lot of these stories in here. 
At the same time, you also get stories of projectionists that are a little, I wouldn't say sad, but when you hear about the hours they worked and also what their day, their workday was like, there certainly is a lot of isolation to their careers up to the point where they actually changed. And upon watching it, I certainly have an appreciation for what projectionists did back when they used film and even what they do now when they use digital equipment. But I don't know if I could be an actual projectionist because I think the life would be a little bit too lonely for me. Having said that, there, you, you definitely had a sense of what the projectionists loved about their jobs. And I thought that's where The Dying of the Light had its most poignancy. As for digital projection, I suppose it makes the image that's projected onto the screen look pretty good. Um, I do have to say that I, I don't know if film actually made the screen look better the movie that's showing on the screen look better. I do have to say that whenever I go to a mainstream multiplex like Regal Fenway 13, and that's the only one I'll mention, I don't think the quality of the film you see on screen is nearly as good as the quality you see when we watch a movie on Blu-ray. In fact, that's what I was thinking when I was watching The Jungle Book a couple of days ago. I was thinking, if I saw this in Blu-ray, it would look a lot clearer. It would look like somebody filmed this using a video camera in their backyard. A very elaborate backyard. But I I think you know what I mean when I, I say that. But The Dying of the Light is certainly an enlightening documentary. And I've always been curious, since I started critiquing film, It seems like there are two kinds of documentaries. There are either good ones or bad ones. There aren't any ones that are really in between to a certain degree. So I've always been considering changing my rating system for documentaries. For those of you who don't know, my rating system is knockout, checkout, strikeout, flunkout, with knockout meaning it's a great movie and you should see it, particularly in theaters. Checkout being it's a good movie, It has flaws, but it's still worth seeing. Strike Out, a movie with too many flaws, in other words, a bad movie, and Flunk Out being a movie that's an absolute waste of time. For documentaries, I was thinking, well, either a documentary tells a story clearly and with good organization, or it doesn't. And I think The Dying of the Light tells a a very, actually, several intriguing stories. One is the lives of the projectionists, both when they used film and when they converted to digital, if they made it that far, and also the history of film at the movie theaters. In fact, I thought that was a really intriguing part. You learn about various movie theaters, including one in Chicago that prides itself on showing movies the old-fashioned way with in organist and also using a curtain to open up the screen and closing the curtain almost immediately after the film ends. And I, I thought there was a certain amount, there, there was definitely a lot of nostalgia to that part of the movie, but I also found it fascinating just for the history and the fact that some people are keeping on that tradition. As for the tradition of using film to project movies, I don't know if enough people care about the source of the movie as long as it looks good, but it's still great to know the history. So until I get a new rating system for documentaries, I give The Dying of the Light my rating of a knockout. It is a very intriguing documentary, and it also ends on a note which I won't give away, but it involves one of the career projectionists who has since changed careers and his philosophy on the shift from film to digital projection. It's a really good way to end the documentary, and it's a great documentary overall. So I've got to see five new movies before I come back. But until I do, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.